in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 40. The scriptures, inspired by the Holy Spirit, say this. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Thanks, Dave. Well, it's great to see everybody here. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it's always a good thing to have people in your life that you love, and it's good to have chocolate, too. So hopefully you got both uh, people that you love and uh, maybe a little bit of chocolate or, or at least something with Valentine's Day that says, this person is special to me. Um, I did want to make one announcement for you today so that you will know. Um, you may have gotten a wedding invitation for February 20th for Zach and Serena Crystal, um, in case you don't know Zach and Serena Crystal. Their wedding was December 21st, and so if you show up, you will not get cake. I just want you to know that the wedding they had planned and sent out invitations, and uh, that's already passed. Um, so they just wanted to make sure that you knew that, you know, they are already married and uh, everything is good and life is wonderful, and please don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> so. And especially encourage them if you're able to see them and they're here sometimes and uh, just be able to encourage them. They're a great young couple. We want to talk about love today. That's absolutely right. I appreciate the songs. They help us in loving God. They help us in loving each other. And so we want to talk a little bit about love today and how much God loves us. We see it in his creation. We see it in all kinds of things around he has made this a beautiful place, especially Arizona, uh, because of all the sunshine. And you're just able to have sun all the time. There is no depression here from cloudy days all the time. Uh, despite that everything is brown, we still have sunshine, and maybe that's a reason why. Uh, we see it in the love God has for us. We see it in the relationship. We see it in the relationship with other people. And how we learn how to love because God loved us first. And so what do we think about when we think about being loved much? Being loved a lot. Um, how do you know when you're loved a lot? Well, maybe you can think back to when you were first married like Zach and Serena here. And you can go, well, that's what it's like. That's what it means and... Well, but what about now? Well, there's been a few years that have passed, but it's still love, right? Somebody came up with a while back that there are different languages of love. And so I just wanted to remind you of those a little bit this morning because everybody loves in a different way. And sometimes we go about it the wrong way, and so I just wanted you to look at these for a minute, 
And then let's think about God's love and about our response of love to God. Sometimes it's gifts. That's what it means. You love somebody, you get stuff, right? You get jewelry, you get chocolate, you get and you get and you get. And so that's what it means. The more things you buy somebody, the more they love you. Now, this is true a lot of children, and that's what they think. But as we grow up, we find out it's not just about that. It's not just about the fact that we get things. Because then all of a sudden, we have no place to put all this stuff. And we just can't keep getting more and more and more. And is it just about the stuff? About all the things that you can get? Well, it seems not to be. Because you can get all kinds of things. There's, there's these stuffed bears on the corner up here. And uh, red balloons. And if you get a stuffed bear, does that make you feel like a valentine? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But I'm not sure it's the abundance of the gift that matters. But maybe the better the gift or the more thoughtful the gift. Not even the more expensive, but the more thoughtful the gift, the more we realize someone loves us. The second one is words of affirmation. When you tell somebody that you love them, that's important. You tell them what you appreciate about them. And so you're going to share the good things that you know about them. And some people, that's what does it for them. That they are people who, who will listen to what you say. And when you say it to them, that makes all the difference. It doesn't matter how much you give them because that doesn't say anything. But when you tell them, that's what makes the difference. Now, you realize that also it's not just talking all the time because that can get really annoying if you're just talking and talking and talking and talking, but maybe the better you express it and the better way of saying something that makes the difference. Sometimes it's physical touch, and we understand that. You know, it feels good to be touched. It's one of those things that conveys love. But have you ever just been touched so much that you can't stand it anymore? It's like, get away from me. Uh, we don't appreciate that. Maybe it's the better way of touching or the more appropriate way. Sometimes it's acts of service, and I think guys are especially about this. You know, I went to my job. I brought home money. Don't you know that I love you? Because I worked and I worked and I worked and I worked and... No, we were wanting gifts or we were wanting some words. And so it's not just about the acts of service, about the washing the car and washing the dishes and cleaning the dog and, you know, digging the moat around the house. You decide, I didn't really want a moat around the house. And so I'm not sure acts of service does that all the time. And so maybe it's about the better way that we serve that says love. And the last one is spending quality time. And so there has to be time that is spent. It's not just, hey, love you, bye, and that's all there is. I came, I delivered the gift. Well, you can get that from the UPS guy. I mean, that's not necessarily love, and so it's about spending that quality time. You don't have to say a lot, but they can appreciate the fact that you were there. Of course, if that goes too far, we call it stalking. And so, I'm not sure it's spending quality time then, but maybe it's the amount of time and the way in which it's done. And all of these things are about the way in which it's done. It's not so much in the deed itself. Of course, you have to know what the person likes best. What do you like to do when you think of love? And you really ought to think of what they think of love. And what does that do? Well, when does God notice? When does God notice love? How can He tell that we love Him? Does He go by acts of service? Does He go by quality time? What does God go by when we look at Him? And I think the story that we're doing today especially describes 
this idea of what God looks for when he looks for love. And so let's look, take a look at this. Simon has asked Jesus to come to his house for dinner. We would think Simon is a good guy. Simon is great. He's one of the Pharisees. He's intelligent. He's got a house. He's got uh, the ability to give a place where Jesus can relax. And Simon is one of those good people. But Simon is also good at hiding anything that's a problem for him. And so he doesn't need very much from Jesus. He just wants Jesus to come because after all, Jesus is a little bit of a celebrity. And so that helps him to be able to get some status maybe from Jesus. And that's kind of the story we see. Um, He doesn't show much love. He doesn't need much love. There's not a lot of things that he has to have. There's no real weakness that he's showing. There is this woman on the other side, and it doesn't even give us her name. She's kind of the hero in the story, and it doesn't even give us who she is. And maybe Jesus never finds out her name, but I think he probably would. She's not invited to the dinner. I don't know if she knows Simon previous to this. She knows at least where Jesus is. She decides she's going to go in and she is going to be part of this, and she just shows up. And Simon seems to already know who she is and what she has done And the fact that she is a woman of the city, which is not a good thing. He knows that she is a sinner. We would think she's got problems. After all, if somebody comes to your house for lunch today and starts taking off your shoe, uh, we would think, okay, this lady's got some problems when we don't know who she is. She is very upset about her past. She looks guilty. She looks like she is dealing with a lot of things, and she looks like she does not have it all together, and so we might be a little nervous around her. We don't know what she wants. She doesn't seem like she needs to be healed of anything. Uh, She's just come, and here she is, and she's acting in this very strange way with the tears and the crying and wetting his feet and wiping his feet, and then when the bottle opens, the perfume just kind of goes everywhere, doesn't it? You can smell it all over the house, and she anoints his feet, and she begins to kiss his feet. What's her love language? Is it touch? Is this an act of service? Is this giving as an act of generosity? Because this is a very expensive bottle of perfume. And maybe she's got several things going here. And Simon assumes that Jesus would know who she is if he's any kind of a prophet at all. And he would want to avoid her at all cost. Because after all, she's a sinner. And she's come and she's interrupting the good people. Uh, You know how it is. We have good people and then those other ones. And so she's come and she's interrupting the good people and the nice dinner and, you know, you've got the perfume going everywhere and Simon has a judgment of her that she is a sinner and her sin is different from his sin. Her sin is definitely worse than his sin, assuming he has sin. And I think we can always make that assumption of every single person. And sometimes we do hold sins to be worse, don't we? Some people's sins are worse. Of course, ours we understand. We know why we did those things. And, you know, they're explainable. They're something we can deal with. But hers, boy, I don't know. We just have a harder time with that. Some crimes we think are worse. Some attitudes we think are worse. But at the bottom line, all sins can be forgiven. And I think that's maybe the point of the whole story. There are no sins that God cannot forgive. And we just need to know that coming in. Well, Jesus sees all this playing out, and so if you look at verse 40 again, we can see the rest of the story. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. 
And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and another 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Interesting the way Jesus does this as he meets these very different people from right next door almost, but they're miles apart in society. One is very well accepted and respected, and the other one is not at all. And so when we look at this, how is Jesus going to do this? How will he ever be able to get across to Simon or to us as we look at the story? And so Jesus decides to tell his own story. And this is what he does. He says there's two money lenders. One owes 10 times as much as the other. And he forgives them both. And this has got to be a God question, right? It's like when you go to the ice cream store and you make a left-hand turn to get in the door, what color are the shoes of the person in front of you? It's like, what? <laughs> what do you mean who's going to love more? What does that have to do with it? Uh, you forgave them both. What does love have to do with forgiveness? Well, that is exactly the point. We tend to separate the two and say, oh, I love God, but forgiveness is something else. That's something that Jesus has done when he died on a cross, and we take all emotion out of it. We take all meaning out of it. It doesn't have anything to do with love or any kind of a love response. We make it just about the legal aspect of justification, and Jesus is saying here, that's not true. It is about love when we talk about forgiveness. We tend to separate that and make it more about justice, but that's not what he's trying to do. So what does love have to do with how much you're forgiven? Does greater generosity mean greater appreciation? greater feeling? Well, usually yes, right? I mean, just think about it. Can you remember the times when people loaned you a stick of gum? Probably not. <laughs> but can you remember the times when they gave you something worth over a thousand dollars? Yeah, you probably remember those people. There's not as many, but we tend to remember the bigger gifts and people who gave us such huge things. We can remember those a whole lot easier because they're just so unusual. And it's just one of those things. So let me tell you a story about one of mine. We've had a lot of people who have been very generous to Nancy and I. And it's... I'm not going to list them all for you because some of them are you. Uh, but there has been a whole lot of people who have just been very generous and very loving toward us, and that's been great. But there was one particular time back many, many years ago when we decided we were going to go on vacation. We were going to go see Nancy's folks. We lived in Titusville, Florida at the time, so that's been a long time ago. And we decided to pack up the kids who were like this big, and uh, we got everything ready. We're going to leave the next morning. I think we were leaving like 3 in the morning. 
And so we get in the car and we, we made it up, which is surprising. We get in the car and we take off and we're headed north. We're going to see Nancy's folks. And we get about to St. Augustine, if you're familiar with that part of the country. And we're just doing great, just going along and you hear this bang, 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 bang. And I'm like, what? <laughs> What's going on? And it just gets a little bit louder as you're driving along. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, this is not good. And sure enough, when you slow down, it stops. It quits banging quite so much because you think, well, something's just loose or rattling. Or, and no, that's not it. So we pull off at this exit, which is actually before St. Augustine, which has a gas station and nothing else. It's about 4.30 in the morning because this is, you know, 90 miles. And I open the hood because that's what you do when you think you have car trouble. (laughs) And I look inside and the manifold is bright cherry red. And when you try and start the car, it doesn't bang quite as loud or quite as fast. Bang, 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 bang. And you realize this is not good. There is not going to be a vacation. Sure enough, it's thrown a rod, if you understand what that means. It means you're not driving anywhere. That's basically what it means. So, who, what do we do now? The kids are asleep in the car. We have everything for this vacation. It's all packed. It's all planned. And now we are miles from home. So... There was an elder in the church there named Marion Sees, and he's the guy that I called whenever I had car trouble because for some reason, you know those people that just seem to know about cars? Usually you try and find one everywhere you go, and he was one of those guys who, no matter what kind of a car you had, he would kind of know some about it. So I, of course, this is real early in the morning. I think we tried to wait a little while uh, at least till it was light. But I called him. I said, Marion, I've got a problem. I don't, uh, I don't even know what else to do from here. I guess, you know, we got to tow the car back home or something. And, and he said, well, tell you what, don't worry about it. He said, I'm off today. I'll come up and we'll tow it back. He says, you're only an hour and a half. We'll just tow it back. So, Okay. We're sitting there waiting. He gets everything together, and he comes up, and he comes with a guy in a truck where they're able to get a tow dolly and tow us, but he's also come in his car, his brand-new car, brand-new Mercury Sable, three days old. And he says, yeah, you guys already know. Let's put all your stuff in my car, and you're going to, it's been a long time ago, Eve, <laughs> and you're going to take my car and go on vacation. I said, Marion, this is a brand new car. You've only, you don't even have a thousand miles on the car yet. And he's like, no, nope, that's what we're going to do. That's what you're going to do. Well, at some point, you just have to say thank you. And so, sure enough, that's what we did, and we traded his brand new car and put sleepy kids and all the luggage and all the stuff in there, and we gave him our problem, and he towed it back, and it was sitting in the driveway when we got back, but we took off from there and drove up and had a good time on vacation with a brand new car. And got to see Nancy's folks and enjoyed that time. Nancy's dad was never a Christian. Didn't like Christian people. Was very upset she married a preacher. Did not appreciate that at all. And we pull up in a brand new car and he's like, wow, you guys are doing a lot better than I thought. (laughs) Well, not so much. (laughs) And so we told him what happened, and he couldn't believe it. He's like, 
I've never heard of anything like this. I said, well, that's the way it is. He said, you guys have something different. You guys have something that I haven't ever seen before. And I think at that point, he quit worrying about Nancy and quit worrying about us. Because if we were part of something like that, we were fine. There's no other way to explain that to him other than that act of love. Well, that's not exactly a sin, maybe an accident, maybe a mistake. It was at least a problem, a place where we were in need. And sure enough, that's an expression of love. My question is, do we love when someone forgives us? Do we love more when they forgive us? That's what he says. Those who have been forgiven much love much. I can tell you we appreciate Mary and C's forever. But I don't think we do this with people, especially when it comes to repentance and especially when it comes to forgiveness. Sometimes we feel ashamed if the person has sinned against us and done something wrong to us. And yes, we'll forgive them, but we don't want to be around them. We don't want to be there with them. It could be the greatest love, but we just don't see it that much where we would bond around a problem that's a sin. We bond around a problem that's a broken car. But I'm not sure we're going to do that around something that's a sin. We're ashamed of it. And we can either be ashamed of it or we can realize it's what they helped with. It's something that we can't believe we did. Maybe they can't believe we did, but we did it. And they forgave us, and now we don't want to see them. And it ruins relationship more than it builds relationship. And Jesus is saying it should be the opposite. It ought to make greater love. We can hardly forgive ourselves, but they told us they believed us, and so we were willing to do that. That's good. I'm glad you forgive us. And we just try not to look as guilty when we see them. But if we could ever find real forgiveness and trust them and realize that, you know what, we, that's long past, and we've gotten past that, and we've gone on to something else, to allow someone to love us, when it was in our weakness. Yeah, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? I think that's what Jesus talks about here, and Nancy's dad's right. We don't see that very often. What this woman did is she came and wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. She kissed his feet, and she anointed his feet with perfume. How would we do that today? I don't think it's going to be good interrupting dinner (laughs) for anyone. And so maybe that's not a good example of what we should do, but the principle is here. It's all the same. You see, her sins are public. Simon knows who she is. I doubt he associates with her, but he knows who she is. Everybody knows who she is, and what she did was public, and I'm not sure that's the best way we should go about our repentance. There may be some better ways, like at the end of the service, we always have elders who come up here, and if you need to repent, I would say that's a better way. Please don't kiss their feet. Uh, It might give them 
the big head, and we don't want people doing that to our elders, getting them to think they're more important than what they are, but that you would pray with them and confess to them and be able to say, yeah, I didn't do this right, so that people could love you and so that you could love God. You realize that she repents to Jesus. She does not repent to Simon. And I think that's an important thing for us to realize in all of this. You do not repent to the people who know you're guilty. I think sometimes we assume that. Well, I know that they did something wrong, so they ought to repent to me. Not at all. Unless you were directly involved in it, maybe they should. But they just need to repent to God. You don't have to go around to every single person who knows the things that you did and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I... But they weren't even in it. She repents to Jesus. And that's what's more important. And that's what Jesus is trying to say here because when it comes right down to the bottom line, Simon is never going to forgive her. She's going to get no love from him. There's going to be no response. And so we show repentance and love to God because he's the one who forgives when Jesus turns to Simon, he says, you didn't do any of this for me. No washing, no drying with hair, no kiss, no anointing, even my head. You did have good dinner. That's about as far, but Simon was going to eat anyway. So, is Jesus upset at the lack of service? No, that's not what it's about. It's about how Simon doesn't care, how little he cares about Jesus or about what's going on with him. It's a great dinner. It's fine. It's good. We all came together. We all ate. I was able to give you something and that you can, because it's not personal. It doesn't have anything personal about it. And Jesus is saying, maybe we need to pay attention to the details It shows whether something is personal or not. But Jesus died for everybody, right? He died for all people one time on a cross. So my sin, whatever it is, is paid for because Jesus died for my sin. And your sin is paid for because Jesus died for your sin. And... Any sin that anybody commits would be paid for by Jesus' crucifixion on a cross, by his death. And so, actually, it's all kind of the same, right? Because there isn't a sin that's bigger than another, is there? Or is there? And so, we've all paid for the same thing. It's all the same price. It's just Jesus' death. And it becomes so much less personal. What I want you to realize is that sins are not all the same. Yes, some are worse than others. Some are much worse than others. Do you know the worst sin? They're not all equal. The worst sin is mine. That one's personal. To you, the worst sin is yours. It doesn't matter what anybody else has done. The worst one is yours. The worst one to me is mine. The contrast is in the way things are done. Jesus saw her repentance and her love for God. Was it the right love language? It was all personal to her. Her embarrassment, her confession, I think she confesses her sins because Jesus doesn't do anything for people if they don't tell him what's going on. He doesn't even heal a blind man who's blind right in front of him. He says to him, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I'm blind. Could you heal me? 
And the woman comes, what do you want me to do for you? And I think she tells him, here's who I am. And he's able to say, you're forgiven. What an incredible thing. You're forgiven. Jesus heals her soul because she opens up to him. And the greatest love is we can trust God with our sin. I saw this. The sin in your life is not who you are. You are holy and righteous and redeemed because of what Jesus has done for us. Just to give you another person that's with this, maybe to make this a little bit more positive, is that Paul knew about this whole thing as well. He knew about this from his life because he's persecuted the church, and everybody knows that story. We know about Paul and about his persecution, that he was openly hostile, that he put people in prison and put some to death. How could he face Jesus after he had done those things? Well, that's just the point. Jesus forgave him, and it took three days, perhaps the same as this woman had spent her three days and comes back with her tears and her ointment and says, I want to love you like this. And Paul spends the rest of his life preaching and teaching and planting churches and being the person who responds in love because he's forgiven much, and therefore he loves much. What would a church be like when we realize we have been forgiven much, and we're not just embarrassed about it? That we would actually love much and respond in love to God much, and it might be acts of service that we would do for God, and it's not just a matter of saying, well, have we got any volunteers? Uh don't need to do anything. Were we forgiven or not? Do we have any time for God? Do we have any place? And so in Romans 8, 33, Paul writes this. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Paul, there's a lot of things you did wrong. It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor anything else in all creation who will will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. That's a guy who's been forgiven. Who's going to bring a charge? Who's going to separate us? Now, we're more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors because he loved us and because he forgave us, and nothing separates us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I saw this. Anger makes you smaller while forgiveness forces you to grow beyond what you were. So easy to just to do the normal thing and hide. And we've already been there. We've realized His grace and we've repented and we've been baptized into Christ and we have formed that covenant for the forgiveness of sin. And then we respond with our tears, our hair, our kiss, our ointment, our words of affirmation, our giving, our acts of service, 
our quality time. Yeah, touch we can't do yet. We got to get past COVID first. But she believed in a God who loved her. And Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you because you can believe in that. Jesus knew about her faith because of her actions. Well, was it her actions? No. Don't do those actions, but act in a faith like hers, who loved her as she was repenting. So what's your response today to God's forgiveness? To the sins that you have, the ones that you know about, you know, the really, really bad ones, because you know those. What's your response to a God who loves? I hope it's to be able to praise. I hope it's to be able to say words of affirmation in this song that we're about to sing. If it's not, if you're still feeling bad about that, then we need to go back to forgiveness. Would you come while we stand and sing?